This is Lindsay Clark. I'm your primary instructor for molecular diagnostics and today this is part one of our lecture on nucleic acid and chromosome structure. Um, I split this up into two parts just because it got really long and um, I can't handle more than about 25 slides or so. So for the first part of this lecture we are going to focus largely on reviewing the basics and we'll talk about DNA in more detail and then in the second part of this lecture we will cover RNA and chromosomes. So the objectives for today's lecture are number one diagram the structure of DNA, nitrogen bases, nucleosides, and nucleotides. Number two relate the structure of DNA to the storage of genetic information. Number three, describe how DNA is replicated such that the order of nucleotides is maintained. And number four, define restriction enzymes and discuss their function. Starting with DNA, here are some basic characteristics that you guys need to know. DNA, of course, stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And the sugar in DNA is deoxyribose, which we'll talk about more later in this lecture. But DNA stores genetic information, and it's mostly found in the nucleus. There is a small amount of DNA found in the mitochondria, but most of it will be in the nucleus. It is double-stranded, and it's generally made up of millions of nucleotides. The structure, once it's all put together, resembles a twisted ladder, with the rungs representing nitrogenous bases and the sides representing the sugar phosphate backbone. RNA, or ribonucleic acid, is responsible for translating DNA sequences into proteins. Uh, it is mostly found in the cytoplasm, though you will have some in the nucleus. RNA is single-stranded, and it is smaller than DNA, consisting of tens to thousands of nucleotides rather than the millions in DNA. Another major difference between DNA and RNA is that RNA contains uracil instead of thymine, and we'll talk more about that also. The basic building blocks of DNA and RNA include nitrogenous bases, sugars, and phosphate groups. And these blocks are put together to create strands of DNA or RNA. So next we're going to talk about each of these in a little bit more detail and then we'll talk about how they fit together to create DNA or RNA strands. Now first we have the nitrogenous bases. These include adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, and uracil. They can be divided into two major groups. We have purines and pyrimidines. Your purines are going to have a double ring structure. Adenine and guanine are both purines. Your pyrimidines, on the other hand, have a single ring structure, and that includes cytosine, thymine, and uracil. Now one way to remember these and their structure is to remember that purine has two syllables. Purine has two syllables. It's made up of two rings. Then if you think about anyone that can afford to have two rings, they can also afford to shop at the gap, right? So the G in gap would be for guanine, the A for adenine, and the P is a reminder that those are purines. If you have another way to remember those, however is best for you is what I recommend. Just I want you to make sure that you know purines have a double ring structure and it includes adenine and guanine. Pyrimidines have a single ring structure and they include cytosine, thymine, and uracil. Next we have the sugar building blocks. Now these sugars are five carbon or pentose sugars. And the ribose sugar we see on the right is found in RNA and it has an OH group which is highlighted in pink. The deoxyribose sugar has lost that oxygen and only has the hydrogen rather than the whole OH group. And this is highlighted in blue in the image in the left. And 
this is where the deoxy comes from. So like deoxygenate. So you deoxygenate something, you lose that oxygen. And so you can remember deoxyribose has lost that oxygen. And I want you to know this because if I were to show you a ribose sugar versus a deoxyribose sugar, I want you to be able to tell me which is which, which you can do by determining is that OH group there or is it just the hydrogen. The third building block is the phosphate group. So this is simply a phosphorus surrounded by oxygen atoms. And this building block is going to bond with the sugar building block to form that sugar phosphate backbone that we find in both DNA and RNA. And then on the other side of that sugar, we're going to have our nitrogenous base, and we will talk about that a little bit more um, in detail in just a minute. So now that we have all the building blocks, um, let's talk about putting it together for DNA. And for the rest of this lecture, we're going to focus more on DNA. In the next part of this lecture, we will talk more about putting um, the blocks together to build RNA. We are going to start by combining two of these building blocks. We have a sugar and a nitrogenous base. And remember those nitrogenous bases can be purines or pyrimidines, and they can be adenine, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, or uracil. Get my tongue twisted there. Now, when we have these two blocks, the sugar and your nitrogenous base, and they are combined, a nucleoside is formed. To remember this, think about nucleoside with an S. The nucleoside contains the sugar and nitrogen base. Now, looking at each part of this nucleoside, you should be able to determine if it comes, if it came from RNA or DNA by looking at the sugar. Is it a ribose or deoxyribose sugar? So if we look at the image on the right, we see that there is no OH group, it is just the hydrogen, so we know that this is a deoxyribose sugar. And then, if you look at the nitrogenous base, you should be able to determine if it is a purine or a pyrimidine. In this case, our nitrogenous base in that image on the right has a double ring structure, so we know that it is a purine. And without getting too far into the chemical structure, we can't really determine from there if it is adenine or guanine, so we just are going to stick with, for now, it's a purine. Now we are going to add a phosphate group to that nucleoside. This is going to form a nucleotide. And to remember this structure, note that the nucleotide has a T in it, which can stand for trio, or T can stand for three, as in trio of building blocks or three building blocks. Now this trio consists of a nitrogenous base, a pentose sugar, and the two of those together are considered a nucleoside. And then the nucleotide has a phosphate group. So from here, hydrogen bonds are going to form between nitrogenous bases, and nucleotides are going to join together to make a nucleotide polymer. And all that's going to come together to form our double strand of DNA. And again, in this image, if we look at our pentose sugar, we have just that H, no OH group, so we know this is a deoxyribose. And then our nitrogenous base up here, it tells us that it's adenine, but we know that it's appearing just by looking and seeing the double ring structure. Now, a nucleotide polymer is simply a chain of nucleotides joined together. So let's look at the image on the left, and this essentially is showing you half of that latter formation of DNA. So you have the pentose sugars and the phosphate groups kind of highlighted in blue there, and those are joined together to make one side of the ladder, which essentially is the sugar phosphate backbone of DNA. Then you have your nitrogenous bases. So these are not bonded to another base, so it's basically half of the rung of the ladder. So if you were to cut that ladder in half down the middle. Now this image shows a nucleotide polymer. 
And the image here shows one nucleotide polymer that's bonded to another nucleotide polymer by hydrogen bonding between the nitrogenous bases. So this is your full ladder. And you can see this structure here, it just hasn't been twisted yet. So if you look here in this box, you can see half of the ladder, right? So if you were to cut that ladder in half, that is what the image on the left is depicting, just in more detail. Each strand of DNA or RNA has what we call a five prime end and a three prime end. Now the five prime end, and this is written as five apostrophe, is always the end with a free phosphate group. So again, that five prime end will have a free phosphate group. So you can see here, the phosphate group on this end is not attached to another nucleotide, it is free. You see that phosphorus surrounded by those oxygens, um, that's your free phosphate group. Now on the three prime end, there is a free sugar. And this sugar is not attached to another nucleotide. It is just hanging out down there free, um, unattached. So it's important to be able to distinguish between the five prime and the three prime ends. So always remember the five prime end has that free phosphate and the three prime end has a free sugar. So let's talk about hydrogen bonding between those nitrogenous bases. Nitrogenous bases bond with each other in a certain pattern. So adenine is always going to bond with thymine, or in the case of RNA, it will bond with uracil, and guanine is always going to bond with cytosine. And there are a couple ways to remember this. So you can think apples in the tree, A-T, and cars in the garage, C and G. For me, um, this comes from my micro background, um, but when I hear GC, I always think of gonorrhea and chlamydia. So I remember that GC goes together, they're both STIs. Um, a lot of times you have patients that have gonorrhea, they also might have chlamydia, so they kind of go hand in hand. Now, when A bonds with T, we have two hydrogen bonds that form between them. So you can see up here, we've got two hydrogen bonds in between. And then on the bottom, we see that cytosine and guanine will form three hydrogen bonds. So back to our memory tools. Um, if you think about GC, gonorrhea, chlamydia as STIs, think about how STIs are spread. They are spread more quickly when three people are involved versus two, right? So that's how I remember that GC forms three bonds while AT forms two. Kind of a weird memory tool, but it works. So just a quick note also on why purines and pyrimidines bond the way they do. So notice that a purine always bonds with a pyrimidine. You don't see two purines bonding together and you don't see two pyrimidines bonding together. The reason for this is basically so the bonded pairs will sort of fit in the diameter of the double helix. Once that DNA is twisted up, two purines would be too large and two pyrimidines would be too small to keep that structure how it needs to be to stay together. Okay, so once the three building blocks assemble to form our DNA, it's gonna start to take shape as our double helix. So let's talk a little bit more about our DNA structure. So the building blocks of DNA assemble to form those nucleotide polymers, which are chains of nucleotides. So when two polymers are formed, base pairing produces the latter formation with one strand complementary to the other. Now complementary refers to the base pairing following Chargoff's rules where A bonds with T and G bonds with C. The two complementary strands are also anti-parallel, meaning the five prime end of one strand bonds with the three prime end of the other strand. <clears throat> 
and once the base pair interactions form the ladder, the structure will twist and form that famous double helix. And the reason for this is that the nitrogenous bases that are in the middle, the rungs of the ladder, they are hydrophobic and the sugar phosphate backbone is actually hydrophilic. Now because of this, that structure will twist up to protect those nitrogenous bases from water in the cell and sort of expose that sugar phosphate backbone to more of the water. To review, so far we've talked mostly about DNA. Um, we talked about the building blocks and the structure. DNA is a double-stranded molecule and remember it has anti-parallel strands. Five prime end of one strand bonds to the three prime end of the other strand. And remember the bases are also complementary to each other, meaning A bonds to T and G bonds to C. And these are bonded by hydrogen bonds. Now each strand has a sugar phosphate backbone as well. And each strand of DNA has a potential to deliver and code for information. We didn't talk about this um, in detail. The length of DNA is given in base pairs, and that can actually be converted to kilobase pairs, um, noted KB, or megabase pairs, noted MB. So you will see that um, or hear that occasionally in the molecular lab. And one of the most important things to remember about DNA is that the sequence is always read or recorded from the five prime end to the three prime end. So now that we have an idea of DNA structure, let's go over DNA replication. And we're gonna talk about this again um, in a couple lectures, but today we're gonna to have that sort of lay that foundation for DNA replication, how that works. First, let's talk about the key players in DNA replication. And these are mostly enzymes with the exception of the single-stranded binding proteins, which are, well, proteins. So first we have helicase, which unzips the DNA strands. And this is true except in the case of transcription, which we'll talk about later in the course. But in DNA replication, helicase unzips the genes. Now, the SSBs, or single-stranded binding proteins, they will then attach to the unzipped strands to keep them from binding back to each other. Meanwhile, we have topoisomerase, which works to keep the DNA strands from supercoiling. And you can see um, in this little cartoon, which is not too far off um, from the process, you have your little topoisomerase there to the right, um, keeping the DNA from getting super coiled up and tangled. So then we have primase, and primase creates RNA primers, which are required to start the DNA replication. And the RNA primers signal to DNA polymerase 3 where to start building this new strand of DNA. DNA polymerase 1, which is also RNase H, then comes behind and removes those RNA primers when it's time. And this is especially important on the lagging strand where the Okazaki fragments need to be glued together. If that RNA primer is not removed, those strands can't be glued together. And speaking of gluing fragments together, DNA ligase is the enzyme that is responsible for that. So a quick note here about DNA replication. DNA replication is semi-conservative, and this just means that DNA replication results in two double-stranded DNAs, each of which have one parent or old strand and one daughter or new strand. So in this image, you can see the green strand represents the parent strand and the red strand is the daughter strand. So let's look at the DNA replication process in a little more detail. Here we can see the pink helicase and it's unzipping the DNA strands. And the site where these strands are being unwound is called the replication fork. Now just in front of that, we have topoisomerase, so kind of a bluish green there. 
which is working to prevent supercoiling of that DNA. Then we have the single-stranded binding proteins, which look like little green peas. Um, they bind to each strand to keep them apart. The orange primase can then be seen adding your RNA primers, which are represented here by the red strands. And those are added to the separated DNA strands. Then your DNA polymerase 3 attaches to the RNA primers and begins to build the new strand of DNA, which is represented here by the blue. Now look at the different strands being built. Remember, DNA and RNA are always built from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So the DNA polymerase 3 will attach to the 3' prime end of the existing DNA strand, and the new strand will start building from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. Now the strand on top in this image is what we call the leading strand. This strand can be built in one continuous strand because it builds towards the replication fork. The strand on the bottom, however, cannot build in one continuous strand because it builds away from the replication fork. This strand is called the lagging strand, and because it can't build continuously, the lagging strand builds in fragments, which are called Okazaki fragments. Once a fragment is complete, DNA polymerase 1 will come and remove those RNA primers. And you can see that little yellow DNA polymerase 1. It's kicking off those RNA primers there in red. Now once those primers have been removed, your DNA ligase, which is in purple down there, will come along and connect the fragments or glue them to create one complete DNA strand. Remember that DNA strands are anti-parallel and the bases are complementary. So if we know the sequence of one strand of DNA, we can determine the sequence of the other strand. And we always record or read DNA or RNA from five prime to three prime. The five prime end has the free phosphate group, which is represented here by PO. And the 3' prime end has the hydroxyl group represented by OH. So the strand on top is written 5' prime to 3'. Prime. Now notice the bottom strand is essentially written sort of backwards. And the bases match up according to Shargoff's rules. Your G binds to C and your A binds to T. So for example, our top strand from 5' prime to 3' prime is GTA. GCT, CGC, TGAT, and our bottom, I'm sorry, bottom strand from 5 prime to 3 prime would be ATC, AGC, GAG, CTAC, and you can see those bases pair up, G with C, T with A, A with T, and so on, and that your strands are anti-parallel, 5 prime on one end matches up to the three prime of the other strand. So let's do an example. If we have this strand, five prime to three prime, and it starts TAC, GAG, etc., we can determine the sequence of the other strand by matching up the bases and by writing this anti parallel. So we know that T binds to A and G binds to C. So if we were to write this sequence from 5 prime to 3 prime, we would write ATA, CGT, and so on. And we would get this strand. And remember, you're going to read this from 5 prime to 3 prime, so you're essentially kind of reading this backwards. I want to talk just briefly about restriction enzymes. Um, we are going to talk more about this in detail later in the semester, but I want to mention it here because it will come up throughout the semester, and I want you to have an idea what restriction enzymes are and what they do. And we've talked about DNA replication, but what degrades DNA? Well, nucleases or DNases are responsible for DNA degradation.
there are two groups of nucleases. We've got exonucleases and endonucleases. Your exonucleases will basically nibble in from the end of the DNA strand. But endonucleases will start degrading the strand from somewhere in the middle. So remember, exo equals out, endo equals inside. Exo starts from the outside of the strand. Endo starts from the inside of the strand. Now restriction enzymes, which can also be referred to as restriction endonucleases, these are enzymes that attack specific sequences of DNA. These are often referred to as molecular scissors and they are produced by bacteria and originally they were produced to protect against bacteriophages. But they actually will work on all DNA no matter what the source is. Now there are three main types of restriction enzymes. We have type 1 which makes random cuts, type 2 which makes specific cuts, and type 3 which makes non-specific cuts. Type 2 is the one that I want you guys to know more about. Um, type 2 restriction enzymes are really the most useful for molecular techniques. Now why is that? Well we can use those to target specific sequences of DNA and we can make specific cuts and know exactly where we are cutting in that strand of DNA. And this can come in handy in all kinds of molecular testing. Restriction enzymes have weird names, but they are derived from the organism that produces them, the specific strain of organism, and the enzyme number that they were isolated from. So for example, if you have a restriction enzyme, ECO R1, this is a common restriction enzyme, it is produced by E. coli, strain RY13, and was isolated from enzyme 1. So this is shortened to ECO R1. Now this specific restriction enzyme will target the sequence GAATTC and we know that it will cut the strand between the G and the A. So you can see in the chart where the star is is where the cut would be. Now this is actually going to produce two strands with what we call sticky ends but we're going to talk about that more in just a minute. So another example we have SMA1 this is named after Serratia marcescens. Um, some people call this Serratia marquesens. And this restriction enzyme will target the sequence CCCGGG. And it will cut it straight down the middle between the CCC and the GGG. Now this will produce two strands with blunt ends. So let's talk a little more about these sticky ends and blunt ends. The image on the left depicts cuts made by ECO R1 restriction enzyme. And this leaves a sort of overhang or kind of a free flappy section of the DNA strand. And we call these sticky ends. On the green strand, you can see the TTAA sequence at the very bottom there is the sticky end. And the yellow has the AATT sequence, which is the sticky end on that strand. Now the image on the right shows cuts made by hind 2 and this targets GTC, GAC. It cuts directly between the GTC and the GAC. This leaves your strands with blunt ends, which are ends that don't have those sort of free flappy sections. They're just blunt. Now these are important because later in the semester we're going to talk more about this and how this works into molecular testing. But I want you to just have an idea what we're talking about when these things come up. To summarize this part of lecture three, we have reviewed basic characteristics of DNA and RNA. We talked about the building blocks of DNA and RNA, including the nitrogenous bases, your pentose sugars, and your phosphate groups. Then we took these building blocks and we made nucleosides, which is a sugar and nitrogenous base. Then we built nucleotides, a nucleoside plus a phosphate group. Nucleotides have the three building blocks. Then we had nucleotide polymers, which is basically a chain of nucleotides. And finally, those all came together to make DNA. We also went over DNA replication and we discussed all the enzymes involved in their function in that process.
And last, we briefly touched on restriction enzymes, or as I like to remember them, tiny molecular scissors. So cute. So that brings us to the end of part one of this lecture. If you have any questions, please reach out and let me know so that I can help you. This can be a review for a lot of you, but I know that some of you have not had this material before. So please, I know it can be a little bit confusing. Um, let me know if you need clarification on anything at all. I'm happy to help you.